<coughs> Can everybody hear me? Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, and we have a great audiovisual person, thank you very much, who's actually recorded our last two sessions and tonight is going to record and we're going to get all those on a thumb drive and put them on the Northwest Memory Center website. So, yeah, that means I should actually look at, the, you know, I hate to look at videos of myself. Do you ever look at, do you ever had occasion to look at a video of yourself? Oh, why did I turn my head that way? Oh. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, I don't have it. I love talking to people one by one or in a group, and, um, but I don't like being reminded of how I just did it. It's done. It's in the past. Let's move forward. So welcome, everyone. And as I was saying to a few people who are here, uh, this is my office. And my assistant, one of my assistants you've already met, Rachel. This is another one of my assistants. And um, I wasn't sitting in this office because I've, I've, I've been there less than a month. But I was sitting in my old office a couple years ago when a patient well-known to me, and I'm going to call her Helen tonight, uh, she came into an appointment looking more worried than usual. And she said, I don't think I've ever told you about myself, my family history. And when I look back at my old intake form, I never used to ask if you have dementia in your family history. I created that form 10, 15 years ago, and I thought, why find out? What can you do about it? Now, of course, it's a central question, and she knew the work I was doing. So she said to me, I don't think I've ever told you that my father had dementia and his father had dementia, and now I think I'm getting dementia. I'm not remembering things, and uh, I know you're doing work in this area, and I think I better face the music, and you better tell me if I've got Alzheimer's disease. She knew that um, I was interested in this, and we were going to take some time with her to figure out how it happens if it's happening for her, how it's happening. It turns out that unlike just withering away and getting old, if you actually develop dementia, there's about six different paths to get to some pretty different paradigms of dementia. And each one has a different way that you prevent it and that you walk yourself back from it. So we needed to find out, first of all, for her, what was going on. So as you know, Alzheimer's disease is a form of dementia, and dementia just means that you have a loss of short-term memory. You can't remember so well what you did last week. Did we go out for lunch? What was that book I read? I don't think I've ever seen that movie. There are some typical omissions of memory that happen as we get older. If you were here a couple months ago, you heard me telling you the story. It was fun because she was sitting in the audience. I said, ah, this story's about you where somebody, she came in to me about 10 or 15 years ago, and she does this every couple of years. She says, I've done it again. I've forgotten the word for cooperation. In the midst of a talk I was giving, and I didn't remember it for several minutes until I came to the, and I used collaboration, but what I really wanted to say was cooperation. I said, that's not dementia. That's an overly full memory. Or I forgot, oh, I ran into somebody at a cocktail party. I couldn't remember their name. That's not dementia. That's just a full brain who can't access that in the moment. But dementia is when you really can't remember something that you did. You can't perhaps remember your way through familiar streets. You might catch yourself not just about to do something you know, strange, like, oh, I start to put this in the dishwasher when really I just need to put it on the sink to refill it. I catch it, and I catch myself, and I put it on the sink, and I refill it. But no, you find it in the dishwasher tomorrow morning. You've never caught yourself. That's the kind of disorientation and confusion that's a part of the development of Alzheimer's disease. And long before that, if we could do brain scans on every 40-year-old, we'd find out who's getting dementia, because your brain starts changing first. But your brain is amazing. If this pathway to the memory for last week's lunch is not available, 
your brain will take this pathway to find the memory for last week's lunch. And it'll start finding alternate pathways as it shuts previous pathways down. And only when a lot of them are shut down do you begin to find your water bottle in the dishwasher or not remember who you had lunch with last week. The, the mood and behavior changes that frequently come with Alzheimer's happen much later in the disease process, long after brain changes have happened, and long after we can actually identify deficits in memory or orientation. So that all happens pretty late, and sadly, the diagnosis of Alzheimer's also often comes very late, long after the disease has progressed. And I think that's a combination of several things. You know, denial's really healthy up to a point. Ah, no, my foot doesn't hurt. I'm going to go for a walk anyway. That's great if you can do that without injuring your foot. But if you're having trouble remembering, if you knew your doctor could do something about it, it would be great to tell your doctor that you're having trouble remembering. And that's what my patient Helen did. She said, I'm having trouble remembering. So we tried to make a diagnosis for her. And I started out by asking her, what's changed for her? And run through a series of questions, starting out with, you know, has she been forgetting? I ask it in an open-ended way, but I want to know, is she forgetting proper names? Or is she forgetting what you call handy things? Like, oh, you know, this is a, this is a what do you, you know, it's a what do you call it? People that use what do you call it for everything. Is, some, is she getting lost in her street? driving home, driving through familiar pathways to the library or whatever? Or is she getting lost in her day, where she sits down at her desk as a therapist and she can't really figure out how to organize her day off? She had some work she wanted to do, and hours go past, and she just can't keep the organization intact. Is she having trouble keeping up with things in her life? And this was where her memory had alarmed her, because although she keeps a professional calendar with all her appointments written down. She never had to write down meeting Anne for lunch on Thursday or meeting Leah to go rowing on Thursday morning. She'd remember all that, and she found herself having missed two really important to her personal appointments and having to resort to the strategy, which is helpful, but is a strategy, um, of writing her personal appointments down in her professional book. So she says, now's the time to get checked. She really didn't have any mood changes, and I could tell that from talking to her, and I, would have a I could have asked her husband, um, and she didn't have any physical symptoms. So sometimes other diseases like Parkinson's, where someone could have a tremor or trouble doing their normal routines of exercise, can be accompanied by dementia, and that's a different ball of fish, ball of wax. What is it? Kettle of fish, ball of wax. That's a, that's a whole different entity, Parkinson's dementia. And then what we do in the office in that very first appointment when we're still just beginning to talk to somebody and figure out what they've got, we do some cognitive testing. And either myself or one of my assistants can do a five or ten minute pretty simple cognitive test, the MOCA test that our president famously passed 100%, but I think he got the answers ahead of time. But, um, you know, it's a pretty straightforward test. Uh, the woman in question got a low normal score. So that was a little concerning to me. The test we would do next is perhaps ask her loved one, a sibling, a friend, a spouse, to answer some questions. Is your loved one forgetting this? Or do you have to help them dress? How do they remember to eat? Pretty simple, straightforward questions. And then we do some more advanced cognitive testing, either in the office 45 minutes in front of a computer, computer, if you're comfortable with that, or an hour or two with a specialist in town, neuropsychiatric testing, and can give us an idea of somebody's mental status. I also am interested in what happened in people's past, and particularly for some of the kinds of Alzheimer's that we're going to talk about tonight. So besides family and her own personal medical history, and I knew some things about this woman's medical history, which we'll get to a little bit down below here. I want to know if people have ever been bitten by a tick or just spent a lot of time in an area where there are ticks. And that's really to look for a possibility of Lyme disease. It was the medical profession has had a number of impressions of Lyme disease 
which are falling by the wayside. It's not just in New England. You don't have to have the tick on for 24 hours. You don't have to have the red rash. If you're a susceptible person, and that's genetic, you can have a tick bite that you never knew about and still have the disease within you. So want to know if you've been exposed. Have you ever lived in a, dam a water-damaged building? Have you had to work, work in an office that had water damage? So that's part of the questioning we ask people. Have you ever had a head injury? One of the head injuries that we all sign up for every once in a while with our doctor is general anesthesia. That's definitely a kind of head injury, and the older you are when that happens, the more of an injury that that is. Also want to know what your exposure to toxic mercury is. So how many people had silver fillings put in when they were kids? And how many people still have some? Yeah, I still have a couple. And then whether or not we avoid mercury in the fish we eat. So there are the cold water fish, the smaller fish that are lower in mercury, but if you're much of a tuna eater, you're a mercury eater. <clears throat> what I knew this woman had was loss of hormones. So two-thirds of the patients with Alzheimer's disease are women, and part of that is at least because our brain-feeding hormone estrogen says bye-bye to us at menopause, and many people are not replacing it. So if that's not replaced, that's one of the hormones that your body really likes for its nourishment. And then finally, I like to find out if people have either work or hobbies that involves some toxins. We do a laboratory evaluation that includes, in addition to the routine labs that any doctor would do, we do detailed hormone levels, and we're looking for optimal hormone levels. So thyroid, for instance, is something that a conventional doctor has one way of looking at, and a cognitive doctor looks a lot more closely and looks at five hormone tests instead of five thyroid tests instead of just one. We look at adequacy of vitamins. The B12 range is, uh, in many labs is from 200 to 1,200. 200 is not a good outcome. 250 is not a good lab value. 900 to 1,200, that's a good B12 level. So we're looking at, again, at the same lab tests that a regular doctor might look at but with attention to what cognitive research has showed, we want those laboratory tests to be great, not just adequate. We also look for markers of inflammation, and some of those are routine, and some of them are a little bit more specialized. And then depending on somebody's history, if I have reason to suspect it, we'll move on to some other tests, which might be urine tests or tests through um, non-insurance-covered labs. And only at that point are we really getting to non covered services, all the other kind of tests we do, most people's insurance fully pays for. Um, and imaging studies, insurance pays for that as well. So we put all this information together, and then thanks to a systematic understanding of it that Dr. Dale Bredesen talked about in his book, he helped us outline what he calls five, but you can see there are really six different kinds of Alzheimer's disease. And I like to group them into these two batches. So type one, type one and a half, and type two, that's what we're going to talk about first. Those are all fairly straightforward, relatively easy to identify. And if you can do what we agree upon, you are likely to get better if you're in the early to moderate stages of Alzheimer's. Even more advanced, you should see some kind of improvement. And then the last three are more challenging both for me to figure out what's going on and for you to make it right, if that's what's going on for you. So let's go through these one by one. So type 1 is, is an inflammatory type of dementia. And if you're carrying the gene for Alzheimer's, which we've talked about several times, it's the APOE4 gene, and my rough General population estimate is that 25% of us in the room tonight have that gene. Then whatever your risk you're walking around with is doubles by virtue of you having that gene. And it doubles particularly for these first three types of Alzheimer's disease. So people with the APOE4 gene can have the same level of inflammation in their body as somebody who doesn't have that APOE4 gene and their brain becomes more vulnerable to that. 
So when there's a fire burning, when there's inflammation spreading throughout your body, we're understanding that inflammation is an important factor in the development of cancer and heart disease and also dementia. The cells in the brain have little feelers on them, and the little feelers are constantly trying to figure out if the environment in the brain is conducive to a healthy brain. Like, uh, I, my, I know this cell in the brain needs some B vitamins, needs some hormones, needs some vitamin D, needs no fabric softener fragrances wafting through the room. And if everything's okay, it'll keep that brain cell alive and thriving. But if there's inflammation, it tends to shut down the brain cells. And we see that in simple tests, some of the tests that are done on very initial blood panels that a lot of doctors do. So that test, the HSCRP, we, it's called the highly sensitive C-reactive protein. And we think of it as a marker for cardiovascular disease, and it is, but it's just a good marker for inflammation. A couple more markers for inflammation. The low albumin and globulin ratio are just uh, measurements of protein that are on a regular chemistry panel and insulin resistance. So um, we freq- this is not the key point of this dementia, but in all those first three types, insulin resistance plays a role. So this is the picture of somebody with memory problems, Maybe they even have some other fires going on in their body. They have arthritis. Maybe they have a little heart disease, but not bad. But they have something such as the inflammation going through their bloodstream is also affecting their brain. And when we look into it, the agents that are most responsible for brain-injuring inflammation are fragile fats, insulin resistance, and then things that cause other fires elsewhere. I want to say a little bit about fragile fats. So if you grew up thinking about nutrition, I, for some reason I was like totally got into nutrition in my last couple of years of high school, and then it was, Mom, we need whole wheat bread, which of course now I would tell her not to eat, and we need margarine instead of butter. So we've all learned the lesson that margarine is a fragile fat that should never have been made, that causes inflammation, that leads to increased risk of heart disease, stroke, cancers, and actually also dementia. So we also know that, we all know that about margarine, and there's really not margarine on the market anymore. But the thing that made margarine bad for us still shows up in canola oil, soy oil, cottonseed oil, all the vegetable and seed oils that really need to be handled so very delicately for them to survive intact from the cotton seed or the corn to the place where you eat them. And 95% of the time, that doesn't happen. So to, we, can, we can tell that we actually measure for the omega-6 fats, and, and I can tell this from someone's history, and I kind of want to go through everybody's kitchen and look and see what fats they have in there. And how do fats show up in your kitchen? They show up in three ways. I'm going to tell you one, you're going to tell me the other three, other two. The way they show up, first of all, is cooking oils. You know, so I ask people what oils they cook with in their kitchen. Where is another place that oils show up in your kitchen? Salad dressings. Right, I need to ask everybody what salad dressing they use. And you know what the first ingredient on Paul Newman's olive oil dressing is? Canola oil. And then there's one more place where oils show up in your refrigerator. In your meat. Yes, that's true, but the, I was thinking more of a really oily thing that a lot of people no longer put in their refrigerator or even eat at all. Some people think it's disgusting. Mayonnaise. <laughs> so um, uh, mayonnaise, insulin resistance, which we're going to talk a little bit more because that has a type all its own and other fires in the body. But the thing about this inflammatory type of dementia, it sounds so terrible. Like, is your brain going up in fire? No. Your brain is just responding to fire by shutting itself down. And actually, the great thing about this kind of dementia is the recovery can be really quick. You can just change these simple realities in a person's life, eliminate the omega-6 salad oils, mayonnaise, 
and processed food. So anything you buy in a package, if it's got an oil in it, I'll bet you it's not butter, and very rarely now it'll be some other oils. Um, so we eliminate those oils, and we give people some forms of anti-inflammatory, and we just do that with herbs like curcumin, which is made from the Indian spice turmeric, or oils, fish oil. And then there's a prescription, which I, I'm just going to comment on briefly. We could really do a whole talk just on this topic, which is low-dose naltrexone. This is such an interesting little drug. It's come of interest maybe in the last 20 years for use in preventing cancer, treating autoimmune disease, and now treating inflammation of any sort. It's a drug that was used in doses of 50 to 100 milligrams to help people wake up from heroin overdoses. What? Well, in really, really tiny doses, it blocks your endorphin receptors a little bit, and that wakes up your immune system to say, why am I getting so upset? There's nothing going on, and it helps ratchet down inflammation. So we'll often give people with various of these types of, de of dementia low-dose naltrexone. So th to actually tell somebody how to walk back from this, you know, we spend an hour going over really the dietary changes we're talking about and the supplements that would help, but something really important, I'm going to give you in each of these the step you can do to not end up walking down this pathways. And I would say to eliminate omega-6 seed and vegetable oils and to choose olive and avocado oils. Those are the great oils that are healthy for anybody. Everybody would agree. Olive oil should be organic. Avocado doesn't really have to be. And you'll see prevention or recovery of this inflammation. Not always good for um, type, a, type ApoE4. So these are 100% safe. Really good for anybody unless you've got some strange allergy, which I'm sorry to hear about. But, um. So right next to that, and overlapping, is a type where they don't have a lot of inflammation. They just have a lot of sugar. And ApoE4 patients are also at increased risk for this kind of dementia pathway. And the problem is partly that they have high blood sugar, but the real problem is that they have high insulin. So we've talked about this a little bit before. I think people know that when, you're, when you eat something or your blood sugar goes up, your body makes insulin in response to it. And as we get older, our, the insulin doesn't work as well, and our body starts making more and more of it. And insulin itself can be very problematic. Uh, insulin itself is inflammatory. It's often associated with autoimmune disease. And when you've got high insulin floating around, it's, it makes it, the sugar is harder to use. So even though you might have a blood sugar that's perfectly good, if you have a high level of insulin, your sugar's probably not working very well in your brain. There's another particular uh, problem with having high insulin. There's a little guy who works in your brain, and he's called insulin-degrading enzyme. And when insulin accumulates because it's too high, it's really like litter, clutter, mud in your brain. And this guy's first job is to mop up the insulin. That's what he's always tasked with first, as long as there's extra insulin around, he's going to take it away so it's not causing all the problems that it can cause. But his second job is to clean up, clean up amyloid. And amyloid are the fixed bandage scars that we make on brain cells that we're shutting down and no longer using so well. We'd like our brain to be able to clean up the amyloid so those brain cells can recover. But if it's busy cleaning up insulin, it won't clean up amyloid. The healing for this kind of dementia is what we call the ketogenic diet, or a keto flex is really more the way it's termed for Alzheimer's um, treatment. And, you know, this is what it is. It's a lot of different colored vegetables with healthy oils like olive oil, proteins that might be heavier in safe fish and not quite so heavy in red meat, but I am perfectly good with people eating well-raised red meat, um, 
like that better than chicken, but if you, if you have access to well-raised chicken, that's great too. Herbs and spices can be a really important part of, the, you know, not just curcumin or turmeric that comes from India, but peppers and different colored spices help enhance your digestion and your body's ability to use the nutrients in the food. Yeah. Those are the few fruits you can have. So this is, so the question, if I don't know if everybody heard, he's happy to see the tomatoes up there. And I would say, just as I, there are some tomatoes up there, I say people can have a few fruits. But the answer to whether or not you can have them or how much you can have is it depends. I can't tell uh, very much from just looking at you, but I can tell a little bit that your waist is not a lot larger than half your height. So you might be actually insulin sensitive. That's our first screening for insulin resistance. If your waist is larger than half your height, you're probably insulin resistant. Um, but even whether you are apparently insulin resistant or not, you have to test. So if you eat a tomato and nothing really happens to your blood sugar, you can have it. If you eat a tomato and your blood sugar goes up, I'll say, okay, try that with some avocado and with your chicken at dinner. And then your blood sugar doesn't go up at all. You can have three tomatoes at dinner. It doesn't go up. So it really is a question of does your blood sugar go up and how long does it stay up? whether or not you can tolerate more than a small amount of tomatoes and more than a small amount of fruit. You know, if you look back at humans historically, we ate tomatoes when they were in season. I, do you, I, so I grew up in um, Northern California in the 50s, and I remember going to the grocery store. It didn't look anything like the grocery stores we have now. I mean, the produce section was kind of empty in the wintertime. It was so seasonal. And I mean, and that's not as far back as where we really, you know, our genetics are really arising from things that happened to our bodies millions of years ago. And definitely fruits were seasonal in those times and they were a lot less sweet than they are now. So even a few fruits and tomatoes in the summertime are way more sweet than our ancestors ate 20, 30,000 or a half a million years ago. So... It's complex to heal it. Again, we talked to people for about an hour about what this dietary process would be. But it's pretty easy to prevent sugar toxicity if you start early. If you think about it, how many people do you know have cereal for breakfast, a muffin with their coffee, a little bit of chocolate after lunch, an afternoon pick-me-up of a soda or some cookies, and dessert after dinner? I mean, that is more sweets than you should have in a week. Uh, I like to say sweet should be a rare treat, not a regular one. Dark chocolate that's 80% or higher is practically medicinal. And if you can learn to love that, that can be your sweet that you have regularly. But we really eat, yes, I see. What's your favorite chocolate? Uh, stuff I get at, uh, Trader Joe's. Trader Joe's has some great dark chocolates, yeah. I've recently uh, fallen in love with Dagobas, 84%. Anyone who goes to the all the stores in Asheville, and they have that, and they had it for me when I was just in um, Asheville, North Carolina last week. Picked some of that out. So if sweets are a rare treat and not a regular one, you're not likely to end up really walking down this path of sugar toxicity. How do you get starches in your... Uh-huh. So um, they're, at the, they're at the bottom. <laughs> they're the smallest line. <laughs> and so, again, the uh, starches are... Uh, more sweet potatoes than potatoes, depending on how inflamed you are from step one. But uh, not grains, but starches, really potatoes or carrots or beets, in the amounts that don't excessively raise your blood sugar. And for many people, I suggest they have them at dinner time. So particularly people with trouble sleeping when they reduce their carbohydrates and go on a ketogenic diet. It's important to have your carbohydrates in the evening. That'll help you make the neurotransmitters that help you sleep. When I really can't sleep, I'll have... There's actually research showing that sprouted brown rice 
Um, and rice, for some people, is okay on this diet. Um, can help you sleep. But even potatoes and sweet potatoes and yams can do that. So those are the stuff. Uh, so quinoa is not a grain, you know, it's really a seed, and, uh, or, and so it, again, depends, but it, is, it does have a higher sugar content than that asparagus, so you just have to eat it and see how you respond to it. Uh, so for people who are vegetarians, it's probably the highest, probably the two highest protein sources in the vegetable world that are also can be good for you is well-prepared quinoa, and that involves soaking it for about 12 hours before you cook it to allow it to sprout. You get more benefit, less digestive upset, and less starch content, more protein, and tempeh, or sprouted soybeans, um, or traditional tofu, which was also fermented. But what we get around here isn't. So the type that my patient had, that, that's supposed to be in there, um, uh, she had type 2. She had an atrophic tendency in her memory loss. What I knew about her is that when she'd gone through menopause, I tried to get her to take estrogen because I've been a longtime believer that it's good for women to have hormones their whole life just as men have hormones their whole life. Um, and I'd also tried to get her to take thyroid at some point, but she didn't really like the estrogen it made her nervous, and she didn't really feel a difference with the thyroid, so I knew she had loss of hormones. I wasn't so sure about nutrients, but as we talked a little bit more, I think she was really a protein skimper, and adding fish to her diet several times a week became a good and important thing for her. She was a good sleeper, but people who have trouble sleeping, sleep is so interesting. Maybe that's what I have to do a whole presentation just on sleep because when I do these presentations, of course, I get to do a lot of research and learn things that I'm interested in. Um, sleep, it's not that sleep itself is a nutrient, but sleep, if you do it adequately, and it should ideally be from mid-evening to early morning in that circadian rhythm, your body, your brain really does a process of recovery that sets you up for better receiving what you're taking in the next day. If you're up all night stressed, working in the emergency room, you've got stress hormones going all night, and the next day when you eat, your digestion doesn't work properly, so your microbiome isn't that healthy. All sorts of things get disrupted by not sleeping adequately. So sleep is often something that we see missing in people who have this whole picture of hormone depletion and nutrient depletion. It's really stemming from a sleep problem to be addressed. Um, and the sleep problem results in the loss of hormones or the loss of nutrients. And the answer for what to do about it, just like it is for a flower, is to just refeed. Um, for flowers, you know, the nutrients they need are sunshine, and we need sunshine as well. And sleep, we need protein. And we need adequate and healthy fats. That's what our diet really needs to restore our brains. And that those nutrients should include very important vitamins. I had a patient um, seen by a neurologist here recently. It's the first time I've seen another doctor suggest that checking vitamin A and E were important things to do. But So it's important we include this in a healthy diet program. And all the B vitamins, and they have different functions, but they're all important. We look for hormones. So the ones on the top, DHEA and pregnenolone, we look at particularly when they're low in, a, in an individual person, and we want them to be at optimal levels. We want everybody's endocrine hormones, your thyroid hormones, and your adrenal hormones to be working in a systematic way, and again, to be at optimal levels. And then we want sex hormones also to be optimal. And this is a big topic, but um, for women particularly, so many men, as they age, they keep their youthful hormone, testosterone levels, and that's great. But all women lose their estrogen when they go through menopause, and estrogen's really important for the brain. So we do figure out ways to not only replace them, what I would call safely, 
but in a way that improves a woman's health, both estrogen and progesterone in bioidentical forms. So people who have this starvation kind of dementia, you also often see that they have either some sleep apnea or some stress-related sleep disturbance. Maybe they have insulin resistance, again, perhaps because they're not sleeping. And a test that we do frequently called homocysteine. Homocysteine is an amino acid that your body recycles if you've got enough of the right kind of B vitamins. So your homocysteine being high is kind of an indirect marker that even though you're taking that healthy-looking vitamin from the co-op, it's not the right kind of B vitamins for you. And we, do, and we can follow that with homocysteine and some other tests. And a great way to prevent this from ever happening to you is that it's great for you to optimize your own level of vitamins and hormones. So if you have a doctor that's testing you for B12 and they say it's normal, don't just ask, is it normal? Just say, is it, is it in a good range? Is it kind of high or normal high for a B12? And similarly for thyroid hormone, is it really a good level of thyroid hormone or does it just kind of fall within normal limits? So these are the first three types. They overlap and they're fairly straightforward. We understand kind of how to fix what's missing or what's gone awry in them. The next three are trickier. So type three, so if my patient had come in and she says, oh no, no, it's not memory so much, I just cannot get my day organized. I get up in the morning and I can't figure out whether I should get dressed or exercise or do my breakfast first. Um, I'm, uh, I get confused in the middle of sentences. And, you know, I'm an accountant, and I can no longer do calculations. I need to use an adding machine when I couldn't do that before. And my short-term memory is great, but I can't remember anything about the kids when I was bringing up the kids. Like, I, we, they were mentioning a birthday party. I don't remember that. When that's the story, we worry a lot more that the person in presenting with those problems actually has toxic effects in their brain, some serious toxicity. It's often more of a concern if that person doesn't have the gene for Alzheimer's disease. Um, they're a regular APOE3, the, the thing that 75% of us have. When we look at their brain imaging, so if you look at somebody who's getting Alzheimer's disease, you'll either see that, and this is on a PET scan, that they have amyloid or in an MRI that certain parts of their brains are shrinking a little bit. For these folks, Nothing shrinking, they have white flecks going throughout their brain. They're called flare hyperintensities, and they're markers of either toxicity or um, vascular disease. And when you test them, so when we do that 30 point MOCA test that the president did well on, we, some of the test is for memory. I tell you five things, and I ask you to parrot them back to me in a couple minutes. That's the memory part. But I also ask people to draw the face of a clock or to connect. I give them um, uh, some numbers to remember, ask them to name the numbers or to manipulate them a little bit. When people have trouble with these different parts of the test, not the memory part, we worry about them having toxicity. And then the challenge is to find what the toxin is. And all these things can be toxic. So somebody who maybe is, um, we could all go into a moldy building and even live in it for six months. And about half of us, when we left the moldy building, about 60% of us, our body would clean up the little poisons that those mold. So when you're in a moldy building, little tiny spores of mold go up your nose and in your mouth and in your ears. And when they, as they live there in that nice human environment, they make little poisons and spread them out. And some of those can get into your brain. Those poisons are fat-soluble, and your brain's full of fat, fat heads. That's a good thing to have a fat head. Um, so about half of us, six months in a moldy building, we might not feel our best, but a little bit after coming out of that moldy building, our body recovers and cleans up those mold toxins, and about 40% of us aren't very good at doing that. So these are people who have long-lasting effects of mold exposure, or they have chronic Lyme disease. They've been, they have a heavy metal exposure. And the ones we test for primarily are lead, mercury, arsenic, cadmium. 
You know, your greatest exposure to cadmium? How many of you were raised with smoking parents? Secondhand smoke, a big source of exposure. And then sometimes it's general anesthesia. So uh, one lady who called today was talking to somebody, um, a regular patient of ours. She really got set back after repeated hip surgeries that she had. She had two within about a year, one hip replacement and then another. And it just, she took a while to kind of get back on her feet. That was her toxin, and she's kind of fixed that. And to go through a process of detoxification, we like to, you know, your body is capable of excreting these toxins if your gut's working well. And then we do things to help the toxins move out of your brain and into your gut and leave your body. Your body can use antioxidants like CoQ10 or glutathione to support that detoxification process. And then we want you to sweat it out, pee it out, and poop it out. Our new location at Hidden Springs is exciting because on the same floor as us, there's a gym. And I'm hoping that I can get, for my patients who come in and have toxicity, a month's membership at the gym so they can go in and take a sauna four or five days a week and sweat it out without having to put a sauna in their house. So that would be great. And these people as well, we use low-dose naltrexone with that drug that's the opioid overdose drug. If you want to prevent this, don't use dryer sheets and avoid the drugs that are toxic. Like it's, I can tell you don't go live in a moldy building, but you wouldn't do that if you knew about it. Most people don't know. But how many people know that all these kind of drugs can be toxic to the brain? Antihistamines. What's the most frequent antihistamine? So there's really common ones that people take for allergies. What's the frequent drug that everybody takes over the counter for safe, normal sleep? Benadryl. Yeah, Benadryl. Unisom, Benadryl. Those are terrible for your brain. Mm hmm. I bet, yeah. So, um, really good question. How do we balance? So, some of the food sources of antioxidants are in the colorful foods that we eat, some of which are fruit. So, for instance, um, so the blueberries is kind of the easiest one. Could I would say, get, if you get, so I, what I say about fruit is if the fruit is all the same color all the way through and it's a berry, So that kind of eliminates strawberries, but all the other berries and wild blueberries, not not those big, beautiful ones you buy at the farmer's market that are green inside and really taste more like a grape than a blueberry, not those. But if it's a dark berry and it's colored all the way through, you're getting more antioxidant than you are sugar from that. Like huckleberries or or even blueberries, particularly the wild ones, raspberries, blackberries, all those kinds of things. But some people really have a sugar issue, and we can't even give them blueberries. So those people, there are uh, supplement forms of all those antioxidants. And so glutathione is an important one. And actually, you get your biggest store of glutathione from eating cruciferous vegetables, organ meat, you know, things that... So there's different... The obvious antioxidants, the vitamins that we know so much about fall into, can fall the, have that challenge that you're talking about where, gee, I don't know if I want to eat those calories or those, that sugar, but I want the antioxidants. But many of them are really... CoQ10, a great antioxidant. You know what its main dietary source is? When's the last time you had a good serving of heart? <laughs> we actually just... I was just... <laughs> We have to start eating that organ meat we have in the freezer, so we're we're thawing pork heart on our counter um, as we speak. So there are non-sweet forms of antioxidants, and there's always supplement forms. So the fourth type is vascular disease, um, and you can you're more concerned about this if somebody has a history of vascular disease, if they've had high blood pressure, had a heart attack, had a stroke, if their waist is larger than half their height. If they have one of these two markers, the CRP or the homocysteine, they may be associated with inflammation or with nutrient 
loss, that's the homocysteine and the B vitamins, but they also, if they've been high for a long time, they're going to cause cardiovascular disease. So if somebody's had a long time of these being abnormal and a cardiovascular history, we would expect to see MRI changes of cardiovascular disease. And we've seen that in a few patients where they'll see inflammation around blood vessels, some of those white spiky markings. <clears throat> and the treatment for this really has to be a wide view, just like the view you have. I have a patient recently who I encourage to get a CT, a cardiac CT test to look at the um, plaque burden in the arteries of her heart. And her, sc her score was frighteningly high for her. And I said, yeah, but this is a great time not to just lower your cholesterol by taking a statin, because that's not the problem. What we really know about what causes heart disease is problems in all these areas. So you address all these areas. You look for a diet that's going to normalize your inflammatory markers and your weight and all sorts of things that we can measure. You lower your levels of inflammation, improve your insulin resistance, get a good night's sleep, de-stress yourself, don't worry about it, and go out and get some exercise. And so the simple way to prevent that kind of dementia is really to make sure that you're eating real food. Doesn't come with a, if it has a list of ingredients, it may be good, but it's not real food. Exercise and really allow yourself to recover. Don't exercise like a maniac. Don't work like a maniac. Take some time out and sleep and breathe and recover. What about naps? Again, so this is... <laughs> so we, hold, we need a whole night about sleep, to talk about sleep. So uh, there's all different kinds of naps. So if you go, oh, I am a great napper. I just finished lunch, and I hit the table, and I'm out for two hours. You're sleep deprived. That's not healthy. If you say, no, I'm a good napper. I just relax after lunch, and I sleep for 20 minutes. Then I get up and work. That's great. That's a good time to allow your digestion to really work. By the time the nutrients are out in your bloodstream, you're ready to go again. That's great. If you say, well, you know, I don't sleep very well at night, I only sleep five hours at night, but I get a good two and a half hour nap, so I'm really practically at eight hours. Okay, after the two and a half hour nap, until you go to get bed again, those are the only healthy parts of your day. So it's all how you nap. And the last kind of dementia stems from trauma. So the, how many people saw the movie Concussion about the football players? Yeah, you know, and, uh, who have had repeated head injuries. So there's a, typically a history of head injury. The symptoms that a person with a head injury type of dementia presents with will vary depending on where their injury was. The, the MRI will show evidence of an old concussion. And what you really want to develop is a resilient brain. If there's parts of your brain that have been injured in the last half hour... I'm going to give you some ketones. That'll help you recover. We've talked about ketones a few times. Those are alternate fats. It's a fuel that your brain really loves. But that's really not what's coming up here. What's coming up here is somebody who's had multiple concussions. Their brain's just slowly not doing so well. And the parts of their brain that have been injured are going to stay injured. But the other parts of your brain can be clever. And if this pathway is injured your brain really can find another pathway to do the same thing many times. How many people saw the news that was on TV last night that they're taking paraplegics and activating their spinal cord and the ability to walk is still there and they're kind of learning to walk with help and support? Well, there's parts of your brain, too, that we just need to get to them. So all the things we've been talking about, you know, brain, food, the proper foods for your brain, um, a proper lifestyle that nourishes your brain, maybe more supplements than you've been taking and replacing hormones can do a, a lot to help a brain that's been traumatized. Um, and if you just remember that your brain is very sensitive, you're going to wear a bicycle helmet when you bicycle, and you're not going to run on a wild horse without a helmet on and all sorts of things to just do to protect our brains. And one of the things we can all do to protect our brain is to breathe in and breathe out. We're going to do a minute of this.
Let that expanding shape be your rib cage, not just not your belly, not just your belly. Your rib cage and your belly. Going forward, you're just getting into it. <laughs> that was good. We had a whole night of meditation once here. That was that was a lot of fun. It was actually good. It, people actually saw me come down a notch, which doesn't happen often. So the prevention tips that we talked about when we were going through: go through your kitchen everywhere that there's an oil, and make sure it's an avocado or a, an olive oil. Costco is a great source of avocado oil, mayonnaise, and the oils itself, not the salad dressings yet. The olive oil mayonnaise is so good. What? Is it okay? Yeah, well, not Paul Newman's because the first, not Paul Newman's, but there's, so there is a brand of salad dressing called Primal? Primal. Mayo, Primal Kitchen Mayo and Salad Dressings that are at the co-ops. They're at Thrive Market. Um, Shopping, Cart Shopping Cart has them too. And if you like them, buy them directly from their website and you usually get four for the price of three. And they're made with olive and avocado oils. Or you can make your own. What about veggie meat? Um, I think, no, those are vegetable oils. I'm pretty sure. So it'd be much better... You know, it's pretty simple. I have a fail-proof, a fire-sure-proof, fire, fail-safe, that's the word I want, see, um, mayonnaise recipe on my website for using with a stick blender. You put in, I haven't made it in a while because I've switched to avocado oil mayonnaise and primal kitchen salad dressings, but it's just oils, mixture of olive and avocado, egg, salt, lemon juice, vroom, None of this sort of delicacy that you used to. If you've ever made mayonnaise the old way, where you dribble it, the oil in drop by drop, and half the time it failed, <laughs> this, is fa this is fail safe. So avocado and olive oil, they're great. Sugar is a rare treat in your life. Enjoy it. Have it every couple weeks. Have something sugar. And the less you eat it, the less you really want it. So my thing is ice cream. I used to, eat, when I was in college, I lived across the street from my childhood ice cream store, so no one could tell me how much I had, and I had one or two ice creams every day in my junior year. Maybe that's why I dropped out of college that year. But um, So now I keep thinking, I'm going to have ice cream. It's been a long time. And we'll go out to dinner, and I'll intend to have ice cream afterwards. I never want it. If you eat a good dinner... The dessert is superfluous. So it's a rare treat for me. I have a patient who's addicted to ice cream, and he's quite far advanced in his dementia process. And what I shared with his wife and she uses with him is a homemade ice cream, Peter Atia's recipe, that uses cream and erythritol or xylitol, one of the sugar substitutes, and um, makes it for him that way. And it's much better for you, but it's still uh, not ideal. So if you're using it to turn something that is not that So, you know, I think the best source of hidden sugar, if you like the taste of it, is coconut milk. Like, you can make puddings with coconut milk and coconut cream, and you'll swear you've sweetened them, because coconut is so sweet in and of itself. But there'll be no carbohydrates in the, on the little package of it. Um, but if you're going to take something like blueberries and orange rind and cinnamon, something like that to mix up, and it needs a little sprinkle of xylitol, that's an ideal way to use something like that. So these are sugar alcohols that can give a little gut distress if you have a really, really sensitive stomach, but they are mu much more sweet and much less potent than sugar. They won't really... To a healthy person, this is one of the little tricks, and this is true of stevia, splenda, saccharin, xylitol. 
if you are in the I'm about to become sugar toxic category and you eat something sweet, your body will think it's sugar and it'll make lots of insulin even though your blood sugar never went up. And remember, it's the insulin that's really more of the problem than the sugar. So again, it's a rare treat. When you get lab results from your doctor, optimize them. Don't just get in the normal range. Get in the better end of the normal range. So for inflammation, the better end of the normal range are the lower numbers. For vitamin B12, the optimal end of the, vitamin ra- of the number range is in the upper part of the range. So inflammation low, everything else high. Is it B12 the upper range for the rest of the Bs? And the well, some of the Bs you can't even really um, measure very well. No, I, I just said that by example. So in general, for the B vitamins, you want them from the mid to the upper level of the range. Same thing with vitamin A, vitamin E. Vitamin D should really be individualized, um, depending on kind of what your past history is. But 40 to 60 is a good range. 30, normal. 30 may be normal uh, in any individual person, but there's good evidence that getting at a better end of the range is more optimal for brain health. So this is all really how can we optimize your brain health, not putting any other part of your body at risk, but hopefully helping out every other part of your body. Right, so uh, there is a, a genetic, um, there's a gene called the MTHFR gene, which we will not call the motherfucker gene because that would be kind of rude to say, but that's how everybody thinks of it. And it's a gene that, that's the one I was talking about. So here you've been taking this great vitamin from the COA for 10 years, and your homocysteine is 15, and I want it between 5 and 7. And I look at this wonderful vitamin from the co-op, and it doesn't have the methylated forms of the B vitamins. So there's two genes we look at. And if you have a variant from the normal, which is exceedingly common, half of us have that variant, you need B vitamins with a methyl group attached. And you need enough, but not too much, of those methyl groups. So that's something we try and balance on an individual basis. And for that, it's... Best to work with a doctor. There's a couple of us in town who've been working with genetics for a decade or more. Dr. Garodia at Asante. Um, I think some of the naturopaths at Bear Creek here in Medford and um, the Stone's office in Ashland and myself. We've been looking at these genetics with people, and it is important to have that, that to approach your MTHFR gene wisely so you can bring your homocysteine down. Five to seven. For the toxins, if you eat, so, you know, a lot of people say eat clean, but I really do mean this, that you should eat and you should clean organically. You should clean your hair, your body, your clothes, your house organically. I'll go back to a patient of mine, I brought her up several times before, who we did a test before we even started her on hormones, And we found out that she had evidence, not on her blood, but on her breast thermogram of really high levels of estrogen. And we talked, and it turned out she was using completely non-organic cleaning products in her house. All that stuff that they advertise in the TV that's at the back aisle in shopping cart that they don't even sell at the co-op, that's all she used. And just switching to organic house cleaning products, her thermogram normalized itself. That's a study of the breast that looks more at physiology. And anyway, so eat your food and clean everything about you organically. Exercise and recover. That'll be really good for your cardiovascular system. And to the last one, I bet you're already all doing. And that's the way you're going to avoid head injury. You're not going to play tackle football. <laughs> Phew! Good job, everyone. Um, All this is detailed more in Dale Bredesen's book, The End of Alzheimer's. Uh, And we're going to have time for questions, but I just want to lead off a little bit with Into the Future so you can have a few minutes to think about what I'm going to say. So we're back here at the Smullen Center again the last Tuesday of next month, 
maybe not November, I can't, I don't really remember that, and not December, and then we're going to start all over in January, but I'm not sure what I'm going to talk about next month, so I'm going to ask you. We are also in Ashland the last Thursday at noon at the Havara, but only every other month. For next month's topic, I would love some suggestions, anything to do with brain health, and so to inspire you to participate in my request, we're going to have a contest. <laughs> and so I want your idea of what topic you'd like to hear me talk about. We're going to announce this today and Thursday and then on Facebook. So give us your ideas, and you can write it on the sign-in sheet in the back. I want us to get you to give it to us either on paper on the back or give me a piece of paper at the office or here or anytime with the topic on it, how to contact you sometime in the next three weeks by the end of October 15th, and we'll draw from the names, and somebody gets 100 bucks in either credit towards supplements, or you could just say, Deborah, give me your best, and I'll give you $100 of supplements from the store. Um, Northwest Memory Center, we're a whole team. You've met an important part of my team, Rachel, out there. And thank you all for coming. And any other questions? We have some time. Is there any part of the brain that's uh, long-term? Uh, so the, uh, related to the hippocampus, which is short-term memory, uh, no, there's not, there's not a, a devoted region of the brain like that for long-term memory. It would be more the connections that are going between the gray matter and the white matter of the brain. So there's a process when we sleep at night where we oh, save, throw, save, throw away, and only when things are really stressed does it go into, let's, we need to get rid of some of this long-term storage because things are so cluttered in this brain, uh, we can't find it. And it reaches from different parts of the brain rather than just one part. The second, the second quick question is, am I having to play college ball? <laughs> oh, well, I meant at least now you're not playing college ball. <laughs> No, both, both. Do, do concussions have any effect? Yes, in the short term, and many people uh, will notice that their son just takes a long time to come back from normal, to back to normal after a concussion, long after they're released to go play football again. Their mother can tell that they're struggling over their homework. Even when you recover, you are more vulnerable to having long-term problems with that than another person. Frankly, I guess from the color of your hair that you're probably... 60 or more years old. And if that's the case, I think you'd be having those problems already. So, de you know, did you have head injuries when you were playing football? Yeah. A few. <laughs> and, you know, it depends how hard you're hit and how resilient your brain is. So we definitely can see you have 10 people who have injuries. Some of them recover right away because they naturally have everything else working for them. Some people really never recover, and those are the people that start to show symptoms in their 40s, like some of these football players that they wrote about. And other people, it just might show that, you know, if you go have an MRI of your brain, someone might look and go, did you, did you ever play football? You know, you've got d evidence of old um, concussions in a couple different places, but your brain has recovered well from it because you've led an intellectually stimulating life, you've eaten clean food, you've gotten exercise, et cetera, et cetera. They're completely different diseases, Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, but they both can have a dementia, and some patients can have both. So uh, a Parkinson's dementia will not... Uh, so the, the tests that we do, the imaging tests, would help us sort out one from the other or identify that somebody has both. So when you get sh shrinking of the hippocampus, the short-term memory part of the brain, and it has some long-term memory too, but it's not as specific as short-term memory. Um, and on a PET scan, you can see evidence of the amyloid plaques. That is more... Pardon? The white things. No, those are, the, those are kind of inflammatory markers. The PET scan will actually show up as prior to the 
PET scan, which we use for in cancer diagnosis and in amyloid and in Alzheimer's diagnosis. Prior to the PET scan, we used to say, I'm pretty sure she has Alzheimer's, but the only way to know for sure is to do an autopsy after her death. And they open up the brain, and they have these spongy yellow-white uh, clusters adherent to the brain, and if you could look at it under a really special microscope, you could see that there's all these little, like, yarn snarls around it. So both the amyloid plaques, which is like the spilled, congealed cream whip, or, you know, cheese whip, and then the tangles of yarn, that's characteristic of Alzheimer's disease, and you can do a fair, fairly accurate diagnosis from a PET scan. And even, but the MRI can be suggestive. So for Parkinson's, there's other parts of the brain that go wrong. And Parkinson's, there are some Parkinson's patients that have responded fairly well to this, but not, it's a different mechanism. Dr. Bredesen has really mapped out, so we gave, we talked about here five, or depending on how you count it, six main clinical paths to get Alzheimer's. But what he's figured out is that there's really about 30 or 40 things that your brain wants to be optimal, it'd be happy with 25 of them, and it's really a very complicated process. A lot of things have to go wrong for you to get Alzheimer's disease, and our world is just set up now to make it really easy to get those things. Too much sugar, too much inflammation, too much stress, not proper sleep. Um, Our team, right. So we definitely have uh, a team approach, and we need a team approach. And the team starts from people making a call to the office where we have two really highly familiar with the process administrative people who can walk people through. Do you really belong coming here and help hold people's hands as they're not sure whether, you know, we have people coming from out of town, and how do you come to this Strange place in Oregon and why come here and, and get things started. I have a medical assistant who's new to our practice, but she's going to be doing some of the intake and maybe the cognitive testing. And then there are two physicians currently, and we're hoping to get one or two more next year, um, seeing patients and doing the evaluation. But the really important part of the team, that's the whole first part of the team that you meet when you come in the door. And I think... I can't tell you how many patients say to me, you've got the greatest people working for you. I know, I know. <laughs> I want to keep them. But the other part of my team are the other people that work with each patient. So we have a nutritionist who's specially trained in originally treating autoimmune disease, and she's also highly trained now in treating dementia, and knows how to take your particular love of tomatoes and blueberries and make you happy with that so that it gives you enough satisfaction and yet it's in a diet that's healthy for your brain. Or she figures out what starches you can safely have and how to measure those so that your blood sugar doesn't go too high. And because you've had the concussion, she really wants to work harder for you to get your ketone levels up. So she's a great nutritionist. And then we have two health coaches, and they're... Um, they serve a different purpose with each patient. So for some patients, it's really, I am just overwhelmed with these supplements. How should I organize them? For somebody else, it's actually the patient doesn't need the health coach so much as the spouse does because they're not getting a break for themselves. So our health coaches work with each new patient uh, one or two times and then beyond that as needed, but helping them incorporate all this in their life. And the Part of the team that I'm looking forward to having work with us is the gym down at the other end of the hall. So say you want to be active, you want to go on one of Ann's trips and you haven't yet, you come in and you can go to the gym and they can orient you and help you work on some strength. And then it's because we found a little mold toxicity, you can spend four days a week in their sauna. So I'm hoping they're going to be part of our team as well. Thanks. Not really, no. I have a, the patient whose wife is making him, you know, xylitol ice cream, still rides his bike all over town. 
uh, without a helmet, uh, sorry to say, but um, you know, he's very physically agile and adept. It would make me wonder with your brother if he actually has Parkinson's disease or if he has something else going on, you know, so the, the toxic forms of Alzheimer's are like putting, you know, like, like I can't hear you as well kind of thing. They really dampen everything down. They slow the responses. So I would worry more about that. So I think in uh, conventional terms, there is just one type of Alzheimer's disease, and there's not much you can do about it except take these drugs that don't really do anything except in the short term. And it took Dr. Bredesen to say, well, no, have you really considered which of, like, if I called you, uh, your Dr. Bredesen about your brother, he'd say, well, what type does he have? Do you need to do the testing to see, oh, he's got vascular dementia. It's, he's having problems with circulation in these parts of his brain. It's spilling over into his cognition a little bit, not so much. Anyway, I, I think the answer for him is a little more thorough diagnosis. Oh, I love sleep. <laughs> so he here's my two uh, sort of my current favorites, sleep. So anything that the body makes is, first of all, great for sleep. If taking methyl folate helps you sleep at night, helps me sleep at night, I take it at dinner, not at breakfast. So if vitamin D helps you sleep, great. If it doesn't help you sleep, take it at breakfast, not at dinner. So anything that's a part of your normal routine, melatonin, helps many people go to sleep. 5-hydroxytryptophan can help them stay asleep. Those are kind of the routine sleep measures. If someone really has trouble going to sleep, you have to make sure they don't have sleep apnea. And that can be common in people who don't suspect it. That person who falls asleep, <laughs> dead asleep for two hours in the afternoon, I bet they have sleep apnea. And that's why they're not getting a good sleep at night. But just say you're you know, too busy, you're live wire, your brain, you have just a hard time turning it off. Here's two things that you can really help to turn off your brain. And one of them I make people do, but I'm not going to do it because you have a computer in your lap, but is to do something we call the flamingo, where twice a day you stand on your left leg to the point of exhaustion, and you can hold on, or you can not hold on because the balance is going to make that exhaustion point come a lot quicker. Um, so you do your left leg till you can't do it anymore. Then you do your right leg till you can't do it anymore. That's a flamingo. You do two flamingos a day. That helps people sleep. Why? Why? Doesn't matter. I do one when I'm brushing my teeth, but why? It's not so much why as how. So there was this guy named Seth Roberts. I bet you've heard about him from some podcasts, and he died prematurely from a brain hemorrhage. But he noticed that it was true that people who were on their feet all day slept better than people who weren't on their feet all day. But he observed that people who worked on assembly lines slept better than waitresses. And so he decided, I can't be on my feet all day. I'm going to experiment. I think it's just standing. And then he just cleverly thought, and he tried this, and it worked. And so he's, he tried it with a number of people, and that's his first thing that he suggested. And I think it works great. And I, I, th I have a theory about it, but it has nothing to do with reality th that I could vouch for. <clears throat> and then um, the other thing is a really benign supplement. So when we evolved as cavemen and women around the fire, we would cook meat on bones, and maybe some of us still do it, and we'd chew the meat off the bone, and we'd get a little cartilage, and that would include for us the amino acid glycine. And it's estimated now that our average glycine defici deficiency, even if you had bone broth twice today, your glycine deficiency is three to 15,000 milligrams a day. Huge. And it's a component of, of collagen. It's a component of soft tissues. And it's critical to the quieting parts of your brain. So you can get glycine cheap as dirt from some places on the internet, and you can get it in nicer containers from, that's a little more finely prepared from fancy supplement manufacturers. 
and you take three to six grams in warm water before bed, and it really helps you get back to sleep more easily and maybe not wake up as much. Glycine and the flamingo. And then I've got a bunch more that I work with with people. Can I have a really good doctor? Great. <laughs> so I would really love working with, you know, um, I have a patient who, well, like, there are some doctors in the Valley who know that their patients see me and consult with me, and I really consider myself a consultant, and for some people I'm their primary care doctor too, but I love it when someone has a primary care doctor, and I have a letter that I've crafted, and I reach out, and I tell them, I send them a copy of the research and say I'd like to do this kind of consultation, and I, you know, would like to see your patient in consultation a couple times, and I, I don't need to keep owning that person as a patient. I could send them back, or I would really love to figure, I would love to figure out the ideal answer to your question, and I'd say it's a work in process. But um, if you maybe at some time want to give me your doctor's name, I'll tell you, oh, you know what, we've already started talking about it, or there's a few doctors I've started talking to about this, and um, I would like to think that everybody would be responsive because so the statistics came out yesterday that by 2060, which seems like way off, but we're going to have twice as much Alzheimer's in this country as we have now. We're going to have more people, but we're not going to have twice as many people. We're just going to have twice as much Alzheimer's. So it should be something that we all care about. And, you know, like if you, I have a patient who um, was pretty far along. He's got two copies of the ApoE4 gene. And um, I still don't feel like I've optimized things because he hasn't gotten any better. But in 18 months, he hasn't gotten any worse. And if we just settled for that for the rest of his life, it'd be fine. He's totally functional in his retired life uh, at the level he's at. Everybody should be interested in getting that far with their patients. So anyway, I would be happy to reach out to your doctor. And maybe I already know your doctor. Why don't you tell me, Lee? OK. Do you have another question? And then we can. Great. Okay, I was told because of my high cholesterol that I could not eat poison. Then I went on a Mediterranean diet and got my cholesterol down so low in three months that the doctor thought I had cheated and borrowed somebody's ticket for it. And uh, so I love organ meat. Oh, that is so wonderful. You you are a freak of nature, but that's great. <laughs> uh, so the things about organ, you know, organ meat. I would I only choose organ meat from organic animals, although it's probably the liver is probably good from any animal because it's the best self cleaning organ in the body. Um, and I don't think cholesterol's the problem. So I would never have been alarmed about that. The thing that I do notice about organ meats is that they can be very high in copper. And some of the nutrients that we talk about things being optimal, you actually want more zinc in your body than copper. So if somebody really loved organ meats and ate liver every day, uh, they'd probably have to take a bunch of extra zinc. Great. But, I mean, they all are pretty high in copper. So um, great. And, you know, there's some... Uh, the. People that raise animals around here typically sell their organ meat very inexpensively. So, great. Okay, so you think that it's, it's worth the way that you think? I think high cholesterol. So for women, there is no doubt. There's only one risk with having high cholesterol, and that's that you're going to outlive your retirement fund. That's the only risk for women with high cholesterol. For men, it's not quite so clear because they can have iron overload. So if they have a lot of iron, they'll have a lot of inflammation, and then they can, then in the setting of inflammation, really high cholesterol can be problematic. But without inflammation, without insulin resistance, most of the people that have heart attacks have perfectly normal cholesterols. And most of the people, half the people in the orthopedic ward getting their broken ankle fixed have super high cholesterols and they've never had a heart attack. I could go on and on, but I, I, 
Uh, so there's a great book called Eat Rich, Live Long. Read, eat rich, live long. That's, I think, the most concise argument against worrying about cholesterol. Thank you all for coming. I'm going to mingle a little bit, get your doctor's name, say hi to you in the back there. Hi. And um, see you hopefully back next month.